Uh, we're going to talk about First Timothy. Uh, process this a little bit with me. Think about this. We may run out of time. I don't know. Think about this. Uh, you remember, and Mary brought this up a few weeks ago when we talked about Ephesus, but Paul met with the Ephesian elders in Acts chapter 20, and he, you know, he was planning on, he could have gone through Ephesus, but he did. it says he didn't want to go there. Paul, he was in a hurry to reach Jerusalem, if possible, by the day of, of Pentecost, so that would he. We know he was a man because he had a place he was going to go and nothing was going to stop him. <laughs> no side tours. Uh, but he did call for the Ephesian elders, the overseers, the bishops, and uh, elders then. He called for them to come over and meet him, remember? And so he did, and he warned them, he told them, I'm probably missing something here, but anyway, he told them that from among them, even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. So be on your guard. Now, Paul writes a letter to Timothy later on, if we have all of our chronology right, and he tells Timothy to appoint elders there. That's interesting, isn't it? So what what do we what happens in between that space? Did those guys all fall away, and were they a church without elders? And now they're reestablishing new elders. Uh, Maybe they're adding to their to the number, uh, which is interesting. So it might, that might be. Uh, He's telling Timothy as a young evangelist to, to appoint those. He's, he's taking the lead, and he tells him the qualifications. Which, uh, so if they're, they're doing that, uh, I mean, whatever happened to that space? I don't know. I'm, I'm, it's just a great area for me, and it, I just recently just discovered that concept. Uh, so maybe they're adding to, like you're saying, and... He tells them the qualifications. Now, obviously, if they had them at one time, they should have known the qualifications, but maybe they're a little more serious in the qualifications this time, that these are going to be faithful men who really uh, meet those qualifications. So I just throw all that out there to set the background for a historical to get to this point. Paul writing to Timothy, uh, and Timothy probably hadn't been there very long, but obviously well known in that area. In fact, let me do this real quick. Uh, Timothy is encouraged to teach the truth and to combat false teaching. A lot of information about false teaching. In fact, he will even say in chapter 4, we're going to look at that in a later time, some are going to depart from the truth. And maybe he's uh, saying uh, or there's going to be deceiving spirits and those kind of things. So uh, be on your guard that way. Uh, uh, according to tradition, Paul wrote it. The scriptures say it. But I've, I've just discovered it was a little bit of a question for some people historically whether Timothy did or not. I'm not struggling with that, but you might. But anyway, here's Ephesus, Rome being back over this way. He got out of, out of house arrest, and he's going back and visiting some of those churches. And the struggle is we don't really have scripture like Acts that said he went from here to there. This is uh, Acts ends with that Roman imprisonment where Paul is under house arrest. So anyway, there's some pictures. Here's kind of a reminder of different different things. Uh, Paul spent three years there on his third missionary journey. Is that right? 18 months. Uh, but anyway. There's three years at Ephesus, 18 months at Corinth. Okay. So three years at Ephesus, and you can kind of see the timeline. And we, we believe that Paul wrote First and Second Timothy and Titus during that time, somewhere in there. So anyway, getting a lay of the land mentally really helps me kind of uh, with a lot of that. So not trying to cover every verse, but there is some some themes and outlines. I guess I put the short outline here. The more in depth outline was in the email. 
But he does some greetings, normal greetings, like typical, uh, and instructions on dealing with false teachers and encouragement for faithful ministry, instructions about Christian conduct, and then instructions to Timothy as a young evangelist, what he's going to do. What I see develop over time in Scripture in, in the uh, inspired writings is a lot of basic stuff about salvation early on, moving towards uh, living right, and then in Paul's later letters, he's telling them how to run the church, how to set up the church, how to, how to organize as God's family. And it's really important to have good leaders, it's easy to say, well, we want that person to be a leader. But sometimes, uh, I've seen this in churches, not here, but other places where you appoint some people as leaders, and they get to be leaders, and then it's hard to get them out when you wish you could, mm -hmm. to destroy and, and tear up the church. So when you make those decisions, you really need to pray about it, because it's not just what you want. It's you have to look from a heavenly perspective, a spiritual perspective, a biblical perspective. What do you want, God, for this church? Uh, it's not a popularity contest. It's what do you want? And that's why I'm glad we have uh, qualifications and all of that. But there are people who sometimes want what they want. They want to become a shepherd and an overseer and be in charge to get what they want. And that doesn't work well. You need people who have a passion to do God's, God's will, even if it's challenging. So anyway, I throw that all out there. It's just kind of a personal observation thing. About it. Frank's going to read uh, a lot of chapter one, if not all of it, of First Timothy. You just say it, read it all, did you? I did. Uh, I think that's right, down through 20. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the commandment of God our Savior, and the Lord Jesus Christ our hope, to Timothy, a true son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. As I urged you when I went into Macedonia, remain in Ephesus that you may change some, that they teach no other doctrine, or charge some that they teach no other doctrine, or give heed to fables and endless genealogies which cause disputes rather than godly edification, which is in faith. Now the purpose of the commandment is love from a pure heart, from a good conscience, and from sincere faith, from which some have strayed, have turned aside to idle talk, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor the things which they affirm. But we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully, Knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous person, but for the lawless and insubordinate, for the ungodly and for sinners, for the unholy and profane, for murderers and fathers and murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for fornication, for sodomites, for kidnappers, for liars, for perjurers, if there is any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which is committed to my trust. And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who has enabled me because he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, although I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an insolent man. And I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly and in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant, with faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance. And Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. However, for this reason I obtain mercy, that in me my that in me first Jesus Christ may show all long suffering as a pattern to those who are going to believe on him for everlasting life. Now to the King eternal immortal, invisible to God, who alone is wise, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. This charge I commit to you, son Timothy, 
according to the promises previously made concerning you, that by them you may wage the good war warfare, having faith and a good conscience, which some having rejected concerning the faith have suffered shipwreck, of whom are Arminius and Alexander, whom I delivered to Satan, and that they may learn not to blaspheme. All right. A lot of stuff there. Paul communicating uh, with Timothy, a younger evangelist, equipping him, mentoring him, training him, discipling him to carry on leadership in the church. Paul was, he was not trying to be a pope and be the one who made the decision for everybody, but he was dispersing uh, the responsibility of ministry to other people to do, to do good things. So Paul to Timothy in Ephesus, verse 3, and a large part about not to teach false doctrines any longer. Obviously implied in all that. You know, people today say, well, we all teach the same thing. We're all going to the same place. It doesn't make any difference. No, Paul said there is a difference. There is truth. It's rational. It's uh, inspired. It's it's uh, revealed and all of that. Uh, the goal of the command is love, uh, which comes from a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith. So sincerity is important, but it's not uh, its not the guide of what we put our faith in is the, the important thing. So, uh, some, like in Galatians and other books, are trying to teach the law. And Paul says, well, it's totally just and good, but uh, put it in perspective. And the real key probably is down in verse 10 uh, to teach sound doctrine. The, the word for sound is healthy. Uh, what God gives us as instructions is healthy. So I think that's key. Uh, then Paul talks about it in his own life being how God considered him trustworthy even though he, he had a background. Sometimes we forget Paul was a murderer. He was a blasphemer. He was he was, uh, in his words, he was the chief sinner. He was the numero uno sinner. He was the, the worst sinner of all. Some of us sitting here tonight are saying, no, I, I think I'm worse than Paul. So uh, that is part of it. But, but it is a trustworthy saying that God, uh, Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom he is the worst. And the worst sinner was used in a great way. In fact, help me with this, but I would say Jesus is the primary character of God in, uh, in the New Testament, in the Bible. And in the New Testament, I would say Paul is the second most influential, it may not be the right word, but Paul, Paul is probably second in, in emphasis in the New Testament. Somebody else might have something they, they might disagree with that. And I'm all ears. I'm all I'm all for. Uh... Well, I, I think he, we think that because he wrote most of the books, right? The and his ministry was to the Gentiles, which took it out of the, out of the realm of just the Jews. And uh, you know, the saying, the, the faithful saying. Uh, I think a lot of people think of. Of who I am chief, that's part of the faithful saying, and it's not. The faithful saying is Jesus Christ came to save sinners. Right. The rest of that is Paul's opinion that yeah. I, because of what he was before, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think we got to think in God's sight, is one sinner worse than another? In God's sight. Yeah. Sin is sin. If I'm alone, you still say there's no little sins because there's no little God to sin against. And that's. Gossip, uh, anger, there's a lot of things that I think are uh, very, very uh, deadly sins. That If I'm a man of rage, am I worse than uh, somebody who just tells a lie? Yeah. In God's sight. Right. It's, you know, a sin side, is a sin. In man's sight, it's different. But yeah. Not in God. Uh, I think the little phrase in verse 18, fight the battle well, that goes along with what Randy's doing on Sunday morning. Uh, and then there are some people whose 
faith causes them is shipwrecked their faith. <clears throat> and that's an obvious thing to me that says, can you lose your salvation? In other words, not salvation. But they have shipped their their faith has been destroyed and destroyed them. So that's chapter one. I'm saying even these two people at this. Yeah. Yeah, real real people. And uh, who knows how many people they misled. And how, maybe those were the ones that Paul was talking about in, uh, in Acts 20. I don't know. Uh, chapter 2, instructions about worship. I'd like to talk about that one, but uh, no time for that. Chapter 3, the elders and deacons. And uh, chapter 4, obviously, to emphasize again, Paul's desire for that church. Doug, is that the one I asked you to read? Please. Yes, sir. All right, thanks. Please read that. Chapter 4, verse 1 through 16. The Spirit speaks explicitly that in the future some will fall away from the faith, embracing deceitful spirits and demonic doctrines, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared, Forbidding to marry, abstaining from foods which God created for acceptance with thanksgiving by the ones who believe and have known the truth. Every creature of God is good, and when it is received with thanksgiving, nothing is rejected. It is set apart by God's teaching and prayer. As you point out these things to the brothers, you will be a noble servant of Jesus Christ, training them in words of the faith. And in the precious teaching which you have followed, stay away from worldly and silly tales and train yourself in godliness. For bodily training is scarcely profitable, but godliness is profitable for all things, having promise of life both now and hereafter. This saying is reliable and deserving of full acceptance, for which we labor and exert ourselves, because we have hope in the living God who is the Savior of all men, especially of the ones who believe. Charge and teach these things, but no one look down on you because you're young, but be an example of the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. Until I come, apply yourself to reading, to encouragement, to teaching. Do not neglect the gift which is in you, which was given to you through the prophecy with the laying on of the hands of the eldership. Be diligent in these things and be absorbed in them so that your progress may be known to all. Pay constant attention to yourself and to the teaching. Continue in them, for by doing this, you will save both yourself and the ones who hear you. All right. Uh, real godly... Uh, wise wisdom of a older minister to a younger minister about focusing on his own life first, living don't let anybody despise your youth, but live in a uh, in a good way, and then uh, he talks about physical exercise, which is a lot of what young guys think about, isn't it? But he, he talks about the emphasis about training yourself godly. And uh, the importance of devoting to public reading of Scripture, which they did in the Old Testament assemblies, as well as we do in our assembly. We probably don't do as much public reading of Scripture uh, as the early church did because they, uh, they didn't have the Bible on their phones and a dozen copies of different translations on the bookshelf at home and all of that. They came to church because of, to be able to hear what the scripture said, which uh, a really important thing. Sometimes maybe we lose the gravitas of, of scripture. Uh, he tells him, watch your life and your doctrine closely. So doctrine, again, is really, really important. Uh, questions or comments on that one? Yeah, uh, that last verse... You know, for those who want to believe that once you're saved, you're always saved. If that's true, why did he tell him to take heed? Yeah. 
and that you know take it not only to yourself but it will affect those you teach so it's it's a it's a it's a strict warning to uh, be very careful what you teach amen especially here as paul sees he's moving on and he's not going to be around uh, especially when we, we read 2 Timothy, he knows his time is short. And he's trying to ground them in the truth. They're focused on God and Scripture. So, so important. You know, what, what's sad is uh, I remember in the past being at funerals or being with people who have strayed away from the church. And I hear other people say, well, I, you know, he was baptized when he was 13. Like that takes care of everything. Um, that's kind of an attitude some in the church have. Well, I've been baptized. So, uh, you know, I'm baptized, I'm sorry. Yeah. Now, watch your life and your doctrine closely. Okay, the last, this is, Ch oh, Lewis. Kevin, also, a, a lot of this had to, I think Paul was uh, admonishing Timothy to really. Uh, be sound in his doctrine because if we stop and think, the majority, I believe, of the people at that time didn't even know how to read. It. The only thing they could learn was from who was teaching them. So yeah. his doctrine had to be sound. Yeah, and the importance of not many of you should be teachers because you know your your influence on others is really big. Chapter six, and Ken is going to read. Ken Kaufman is going to read eleven through the end of that. This was kind of, again, a lot of uh, summary, but also some of the people and its focus. In, in the verses immediately preceding this, he, he talks about uh, the fact that many have become too obsessed with the worldly gain. And, and as he moves into verse 11, he says, But flee from these things, you man of God, and pursue righteousness, godliness, Faith, love, perseverance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called, and you made a good confession in the presence of many witnesses. And I charge you in the presence of God, who gives life to all things, and of Christ Jesus, who testified the good confession before Pontius Pilate, that you keep the commandment without uh, stain or reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he will bring about at the proper time. He who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone possesses immortality and dwells in unapproachable life, whom no man has seen or can see, to him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. Instruct those who are rich in this present world not to be conceited or to fix their hope on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly supplies us with all things to enjoy. Instruct them to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share storing up for themselves the treasure of a good foundation for the future, so that they may take hold of that which is life indeed. O Timothy, guard what has been entrusted to you, avoiding worldly and empty chatter and the opposing arguments of what is falsely called knowledge, which some have professed and thus gone astray from the faith. Grace be with you. All right. <clears throat> Sometimes the word faith there is uh, referring to, uh, oh, for lack of a better word, kind of systematic theology, the, the system of faith. When he says the faith, as Jude says, the faith once and all delivered to the saints. So sometimes it's used that way rather than uh, just our personal faith in Jesus. Question or comments? On Paul's relationship, we'll, we'll do Second Timothy as well. Uh, we'll do Titus next week. But Paul's instructions to a young evangelist. Any, any thoughts there? All right.
Andy, if you're ready, 